And good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Penn State College of Medicine COVID-19 and Regional Skilled Nursing Facilities ECHO Series. We're delighted to have you join us for this session. My name is Jackie Sable. I'm a member of the ECHO team, and I'll be facilitating today's session. A few announcements before we begin. If you've not already done so, please put your name and email address in the chat function for our record keeping purposes. We ask that you stay muted during the session unless you are speaking. You can use star six on your phone or the microphone icon on the bottom left side of your Zoom screen to mute and unmute. You can also use the chat um, for communicating during the session and we certainly encourage the use of webcams. We realize that question and answer time is important to you and we will try to categorize and address as many questions as possible, but we will always follow up with any unanswered questions after the session. Um, I believe we received a question via email and we will either be discussing that later during this session or we will be addressing that again in a follow-up email. Please remember that if we do discuss cases, no personally identifiable information is allowed. We are recording these sessions for educational and quality improvement purposes, and we share all materials and recordings after the session. In the spirit of ECHO's All Teach, All Learn approach, we'll be on a first name basis during the session. Today's session will include a lecture on PPE updates by Dr. Gavin McGregor Skinner. We're thrilled to have him back with us again, and that will be followed by questions and answers and discussion. Um, during the lecture, please feel free to put your questions into the chat. We have a team of specialists from Penn State Online, and they'll help field questions or we'll address them during the discussion. But please remember, this is all teach, all learn, so everyone can share both questions and answers. Um, in the interest of time, we're not going to do introductions, so as you interact during today's session, please announce yourself by name. Um, and before I turn things over to Gavin, Sandy Clemmer from Penn State Executive Programs is going to spend a few minutes discussing some upcoming leadership development program opportunities. And we will place Sandy's contact information into the chat and we'll be sharing a flyer with you after the session. Go ahead, Sandy. Great, thank you very much. Uh, can you hear me okay, Jackie? Yes, we can. Perfect. Uh, folks, good afternoon. My name is Sandy Clemmer and I work with Penn State Executive Programs and we are really excited to be partnering with the College of Medicine and the folks in the South Central region. For those of you who might not know, Penn State Executive Programs is the executive development arm of the Smeal College of Business at Penn State. We typically work with teams and organizations to support the development of leaders, um, support development of supply chain managers, and really to focus on professional development for folks who are responsible for the critical functions of different types of organizations. We are thrilled that the College of Medicine invited us to be a part of this grant, and we're really proud to be here working with you. Um, for those of you who might not know, as part of this grant, um, we are extending um, attendance to five of our programs that will be closed cohorts only for the folks in the South Central region of this initiative. Um, we realize that there are lots of clinical support and resources that are available through the grant. And I think at the same time, folks wanted to make sure that we're helping leaders and leadership teams at these really important facilities prepare for leading the business side of it as, as we continue to work through these really uncertain times. So as a result, we came up with these five programs um, that, that you might choose to be a part of. These programs are really a chance for leaders to, uh, to kind of call a timeout. Um, to get together on a Zoom meeting with other leaders from across the region and really kind of focus on leadership and, and supply chain topics that might have relevance within your organization um, under the guidance of expert instructors. So as we do move towards that future, whatever it is, um, again, you and your teams are able to really lead your organization as effectively as you, as you possibly can. We're also excited because we think it's a great opportunity for you all to learn from other members of the network who might be facing similar challenges. So for this grant, we tried real hard to select five programs that we thought would have relevance in the context of your jobs. Um, all of these programs will be only members of this region, um, and they will be facilitated using, um, as, as a live remote program using Zoom. So what that means is you don't need to leave your workplace or your home or wherever you're working, uh, working right now. Um, you'll basically log in, You'll see your peers and the other folks and the instructor, and you'll engage with each other just like you would in the classroom, only using Zoom. 
Each program will take place over multiple days, and each day will require less than a half day of learning. Um, so to really focus on what we hope you all would find compelling and relevant, we selected two strategy and leadership programs, kind of targeting those folks who are responsible for creating and implementing strategy and leading your organization and teams. And we also, with all the supply chain challenges going on in the country, um, we selected three supply chain programs, which we hope will be a good opportunity for folks within your organization who are responsible for this really critical function. Um, as was mentioned earlier, contact information for me is in the chat box. Contact information for my team is in the chat box. If you're interested in learning a little bit more, you're not really sure if any of them or, or which of the programs might have relevance, shoot me an email, call our team. Um, we, we've spent our careers uh, trying to focus on helping folks with professional development. So it would truly be our pleasure to answer any questions that, that you might have. What I will ask is if you do register for any of these programs and something changes in your schedule and you can't make it, please let us know because there might be somebody else who would like to attend um, in, in that seat that you're now leaving vacant. To make it as easy as possible, we did pull together a PDF that you see on the screen right now. If you'd like to register for a program, click on the link, which will take you to a website that includes, again, a list of the programs, the dates and times of the programs, and a little button under each one that says register. That will then take you to another page, select the courses that you'd like, we'll get the information and we'll take it from there. So again, most important thing is if you have questions, please give us a call. Uh, if you're interested in professional development leveraging Penn State executive programs, it's a really terrific opportunity. Um, and again, my name is Sandy. My email's in the chat box. If I can help answer any questions, just let me know. So with that, I'll turn it back to Jackie. Thank you so much for sharing that, Sandy, and I hope you get good responses. Um, this is a wonderful group. And with that, we're gonna turn things over to Gavin, um, and I think Mikel is getting him set up with his slides. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, Sandy. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Gavin McGregor-Skinner. I'm an assistant professor at the Department of Public Health Sciences at Penn State College of Medicine. I've been teaching there for about nine years now. I teach three graduate courses. I'm actually going to give you some of my real world experiences. My journey, no, it's not, it wasn't just a journey, it was an adventure. My adventure with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19, started back in January when I was deployed to Hong Kong for 18 days with a team to learn as much as possible, working with the hospitals, the quarantine stations, isolation areas, uh, the airports, uh, other areas in, with the Hong Kong government to learn as much as possible uh, about uh, the patients, the symptoms, as well as the SARS-CoV-2 virus and the risks that it plays. Since then, uh, I've been back, I came back from Hong Kong in the middle of February, and I've been training, running just-in-time training courses within hospitals, nursing homes, long-term care facilities, memory care, uh, and, and now have started uh, expanding that just-in-time training to a lot of businesses and organizations that are opening up, arenas. Uh, sport arenas, stadiums, professional uh, uh, professional sports, sporting teams, hotels, airports, airlines, uh, as well as restaurants and other businesses. So, because why? Because we all have to protect our eyes, nose and mouth, uh, protect ourselves from getting infected by wearing the appropriate, based on a risk assessment, personal protective equipment. Uh, again, this, the, my presentation today will create awareness. Uh, what I'm saying, I don't endorse any products, uh, nor do I uh, endorse some of the, you know, the, the, the actions we need to take. We need to follow the regulations, the guidelines that are provided and that are appropriate in where we work. Uh, again, let's, let's start with discussing. It's really important before we actually put on the stuff, put on the personal protective equipment, whatever that means, whether it's eye protection, nose protection, hand protection, gloves, or, or protective uh, uniforms or gowns or Tyvek suits, we really have to understand, and everyone has to understand, how do you get sick? How do you get infected with SARS-CoV-2 virus? Well, we know it spreads by per from person to, to person. Uh, it spreads very easily. We know that it lives also outside of the body, not just for hours or for day, but for days. We know that those droplets that come out of our mouth and our nose, but also when we go to the bathroom, our toilet, to the toilet, we we are, we, are, we could be if we were infected, we can be shedding uh, high viral loads, lots and lots of virus. We it's really important that from where we started back in February and March, 
here in the US, identifying what was or what is critical infrastructure. Yes, a lot of the focus was flatten the curve, protect the hospitals, but there's so much within our uh, communities, our neighborhoods, that really should have been considered as critical infrastructure. All those businesses, if I, uh, most of my, ex my, my experience, my work experience, has been working in emergency management, disaster medicine, uh, and other in, uh, high, dealing with high infectious diseases like Ebola, Marburg, Lassa, uh, and now SARS-CoV-2, COVID-19 disease. All those diseases, those high consequence diseases that have no cure and no vaccine. And it's been so important in every experience I've had to understand what is part of what is what is what is what is within a community what is critical infrastructure what needs to actually stay open to ensure that communities can function but more importantly what are who, who are essential employees and again early on we knew that they were doctors nurses administrative staff and then eventually janitorial cleaning staff turned up and they they were now designated as essential employees then other uh, community members, first responders, police, fire, but many others were now getting that designation. And the confusion we had and where we've actually gone from where this started to where we are today is much better. Uh, it's improved. So I'm on faculty um, and I'm a staff member at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in the Department of Emergency Medicine. And this is my ID badge that gets me into and out of the hospital to a level one trauma center in Boston. But more importantly, on the back of my ID badge, is my emergency pass, which designates me as an essential employee. And I've tra traveled to, gosh, nearly 12 different states in the last three to four months. And I've had to use this ID card in many, many locations, many places with many people. The challenge that we had across all of the community was that so many of our essential employees that should be designated essential employees did not have a form of identification to use. So we had to scramble and make business cards or letters. And it's really important for even now where we sit now, even though this has been going on for quite a while and it's not the first time we've had to deal with a, a disease outbreak, we deal with flu season every year, with seasonal influenza, we deal with measles outbreaks, mumps, uh, we have other diseases that we have to deal with, hepatitis for example. But it's very important that we need to be aware where we work, in the location where our building is, where our job is, what are the documents? What are the specific standards that are issued by government or regulatory bodies? And it's been so important as I've been dealing, working with hospitals uh, recently and also nursing homes, the number of citations and fines that have been issued because they, th these facilities, the staff within those facilities didn't appropriately identify what were the standards they must follow, but more importantly said, oh, we follow CDC, but CDC only provides guidelines and recommendations and you can't be fined for not finding following the CDC guidelines, depending on where you work, it does vary, but in general, they provide guidelines and recommendations only. So we need to be really sure even now and improve what are the regulatory bodies? What are those standards we need to, to ensure that we can implement? And it's important that we understand as we move forward, where we are now, still with close to 14,000 new cases of COVID-19 every day here in the US, which is way, way higher than we expected in the meetings uh, that I participated in with the federal government, also state governments back in March and April. But what can be done now to prevent or minimize bad outcomes as we go tomorrow, the next week, as we move into a seasonal influenza season, which happens every year. And more importantly, how do we understand again what those regulatory bodies are, 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 are telling us to do that we must do, not recommending, but telling us we must do. And it might be you know, the EPA, the FDA, or more importantly, it might be the Department of Labor through the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And what do we understand about OSHA? How good is our awareness of the OSHA standards and how are we actually implementing? How did we do last year to compare to how we need to do this year? And if we look at the requirements of those OSHA standards for anyone, for any professional, for any expert, they can be very, very overwhelming. And unfortunately, when you go to the OSHA website, they're not all on one page. They're, they're spread over multiple different pages under different headings on the OSHA website itself. So right now, where we are working, what we're doing every day, we still need to ensure that we can, one, maintain a safe working environment, we have to be sustainable in what we do. We have to ensure that we mitigate, identify the risk and decrease those risks and mitigate those risks. But as an essential employee, it's, it's important, not just what I do at work, 
But when I leave work, when I come home, what do I do on weekends? But when I, and, and how do I protect myself in my neighborhood? When I go back to work, what do I do when this insufficient personal protective equipment, be respirators, masks, eye protection, gloves, face shields, or any sorts of protective clothing? I'm pretty sure we've all faced those critical decisions, those really important decisions we've had to make. How do we maintain physical distance as we see the amount of virus transmission decrease? We've been, tr we've been challenged all across the different sectors, the different levels of our employees to run certain critical infrastructure based on what is our training and experience, but also how do we maintain or retrain to ensure we maintain um, skill sets and competencies. Even going forward now, we're going to find ourselves with dwindling supplies. Challenges to the supply chain have been really overwhelming. Many of us, some of us, had to go through an annual uh, fit, uh, 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 respiratory, uh, respiratory protection program, which showed us, taught us, uh, where, what, uh, through a, a process of fit testing, what N95 respirator, our face, the shape of our face, was designed to wear safely, securely, so it worked as it was designed to work. Many of us will continue to do that, but many other essential employees have never been fit tested, but are now wearing N95s, and that's a, that's a breach of the regulations. And again, we're still in an ever-changing workplace. Right now, I'm working with a team of 65 subject matter experts. We meet twice a week. We are looking at data from Australia, New Zealand, and South Africa. We're looking at how the SARS-CoV-2 virus is behaving or changing in its transmission dynamics in urban settings, especially when it is being challenged by adenoviruses, rhinoviruses, or influenza viruses as they go through their seasonal influenza season. The main thing that we have to appreciate is that although there's lots of information out there from CDC based on guidelines and recommendations at the federal government level through EPA, FDA, or even OSHA, right down to the state or local or city level, that confusion is not a defense for non-compliance. I would say in the last two and a half months, I have been involved with a lot of uh, citations, fines, arbitration, and a few lawsuits where I've been asked to be a professional witness or a subject matter expert. And most of, and I'd say the majority of the ones that I've been personally involved in is because someone didn't know the regulation, what didn't, was it able to in, interpret properly how to implement the regulation or the standard, and that's where they, they were cited or fined. And that's, that, that, that's unfortunate because I don't think that's fair. I think this is, this is not the right atmosphere to do that. We really should be identifying gaps and again, working out what are those solutions to meet those gaps. How do we deal with the impact of the correct equipment not being available? And again, that happens for me where I work on a daily basis. What, are, what is, if we have plan A, what is plan B, plan C, or even plan D? Do we make the next best, the best, the best guess? And again, from going back to first principles, understanding transmission dynamics, understanding how you get infected with this disease, with this virus. And so the, again, like any virus, whether it be Ebola, Marburg or SARS-CoV-2, if you get it on the skin, you wash it off with soap and water. Unless, you know, unless the skin is broken, you're not gonna get infected. We really have to be cognizant that we have to protect our eyes, our nose and our mouth. And again, I've been saying now for months that we do know, we have known for years that those ACE2 receptors are in the conjunctiva of our eyes. That is a high risk for many of us that work in settings where there's, where there's a possibility of being exposed to SARS-CoV-2. We need to protect our eyes as well as protecting our nose and our mouth. And again, on the OSHA website, it, unfortunately, not everything's on one page. We have the OSHA standards. We have control and prevention for uh, COVID-19. And then we have more information under healthcare workers and employees. And for your reference, here's the websites that I look at constantly. I work very closely with OSHA, with, uh, with, with colleagues from OSHA, ensuring that what they've put on that website, we understand, not just at the state or county level, but right down to the local level, at the facility level. Other standards that some of you may be familiar with and some of you may not, the bloodborne pathogens. And it's not just bloodborne pathogens, it's anything that comes out of the body that is wet. 
And this was, a, this was when I was involved with uh, Ebola back in 2014, and I had three trips to West Africa to take teams over there to set up hospitals, to manage hospitals. And then I came back and I worked at Emory University Hospital with their Ebola patients. And the message was, it wasn't just the bloodborne pathogen standard, it was anything wet that comes out of your body has virus in it. Well, we can say that that's very similar, nearly the same for uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. If someone's infected, with SARS-CoV-2 virus, nearly anything that comes out of your body that's wet has virus in it and poses a risk. Understanding the personal protection equipment that's available in a way that we, uh, you know, again, we have stock outs, we have challenges with our supply chains. How do we improvise? Do the OSHA uh, people understand what we're trying to do based on our first principles of decreasing uh, transmission of the virus but for, for an infection prevention and control? Respiratory protection. Do we all know what 20 to 29 CFR 1910 uh, period 134 is? Do we understand how to implement a respiratory protection program? What's required to implement that properly? What the documentation, what's required for that? And that leads us to the OSHA record keeping requirements. So many facilities, hospitals, long-term care, nursing homes, memory care unit, uh, facilities that I work with right now are really struggling understanding the landscape of what is the documentation that by law and to meet the standards of regulatory bodies they need to uh, maintain and, and again how long they need to maintain it for and and store it safely and securely so right now it's never been so important to incorporate the regulatory bodies standards osha's standards how do we understand the hierarchy of controls how do we do risk assessments? And I, I just came back from a hospital this morning where it's not about doing the risk assessment once a month, once every three months, once a year, like you did in 2019. It's being able to do risk assessments every, uh, every day and throughout the day and having that risk assessment process always on. How do we identify hazards? Who should be, and, and, uh, should be on our infection prevention and control team? It's different than it was in 2019. And now you've done some sort of just-in-time training, which is what I spend most of my time doing, when's the next training workshop? And if we look at OSHA, and here you can see in the light blue, these are the states, the federal states in the US that follow the federal OSHA um, standards. In, in dark blue, the, the very, very dark blue, these are the states that follow OSHA just for state or local government employees or workers only. In that blue that's in the middle there, the navy blue, these are the states that apply, have their own OSHA, uh, like California has Cal OSHA, and that applies to both private and state, and state and local government workplaces. And they're all different, everything's different. And it's important that we understand, based on where we work, what regulations we need to uh, follow and implement. Here's an example, the United States Department of Labor, the federal government's Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA's website for COVID-19. On this particular link that's at the bottom here, it lists the standards. And again, it's important that when you go to this website today and you look at the standards, do you understand them? Who can help you understand and implement them? Where are the resources available to properly implement and follow these standards? And these have been real significant challenges that all of us have faced, uh, especially this year. I've been doing this now for nearly 30 years, working with high consequence diseases, high infectious disease agents, those that don't have any cure or vaccine. And the challenge that we have after every big disease outbreak, we say, well, let's try to avoid paper. Let's try to not overwhelm people. And I want to put the, pose that question today. Did we avoid the paper plan syndrome? And I don't think we did. I think the challenge we have right now is that our CDC guidelines or recommendations, there's a lot of them and they're all written in English. OSHA is all written in English. EPA, FDA websites, all written in English. I just spent last week working with nurses that spoke Portuguese. They spoke German. They spoke Polish. There was a group of nurses there that spoke Korean. Uh, another group of nurses that spoke Vietnam. Yes, English wasn't there. They understood English, but English was not their first language. And again, we have not done our due diligence and looked at who are our essential employees and how do we get that critical information out there delivered in a way that it's understood and can be implemented safely. And this was my experience back in 2014. Uh, again, when I was working with the, the US federal government, and then I was working with Emory University Hospital. 
understanding that the hospitals within the US were not appropriating or putting any money forward to infection prevention control or training in the use of personal protective equipment, they were waiting for the CDC Ebola guidelines to come out. And when those guidelines came out, they were 30 pages long. And then subsequently, those same guidelines were revised and updated 17 times. And to be really honest, you needed to be well educated, nearly a PhD level to understand how to implement those Ebola guidelines. And again, we said the same thing with, with uh, COVID-19. Let's try to make this simple. Let's create videos. Let's create uh, learning environments that, that are focused on those uh, adults, uh, those essential employees that are easy to understand. Let's not just give them more 30 or 50 page documents and say, here's the document, read this, understand, good luck. That doesn't create a safe working environment. And again, we've seen it with other, uh, other uh, regulatory bodies, government agencies like the FDA. Again, when we tried to understand where we were going uh, with the certain ventilators, the ventilators that were being sort of approved by FDA, but then arriving, I, I know in the hospital I work, one of the hospitals I work in, we received, I think it was like 25 of these boxes with these new ventilators with no instructions. We had no idea who made them. We didn't know how to set them up. We didn't know how to maintain them. Didn't know how to clean them. They just arrived in cardboard boxes and it was up to us uh, in the emergency department to work out how to use them. So we've been faced with a lot of situational dilemmas. Again, the question today, and this is with the same questions we have tomorrow, what happens when we don't have enough staff, space, stuff, or money? And next week I'm going to be deployed down to, uh, to Florida to help them again with just-in-time COVID-19 training but more importantly, just in case we have those hurricanes that are developing in the Atlantic hit next weekend. And we know as we go through our training next week, some of the staff will say, no, we can't come to work. We've got other priorities. We'll, we'll be running out of space. We'll run out of stuff. And it's so important that we start to sit down and look at what do we actually have? Do our inventory, do our counts, work out what we need, do our forecasting, and then put that into place in our operational plans. So again, what can be done to prevent or minimize bad outcomes? We need to do more risk assessments. We need to, as academic professors, as university uh, instructors, we need to be teaching, this is how you do a risk assessment always, every day. This is how you turn that system on every day. And again, the hospital I was at this morning said, oh no, we, we, do, we do a risk assessment, Gavin, once every three months. And they're still doing their risk assessments once every three months. And this is now September of 2020. We need to change that. We need to show them the value of identifying the hazards, identifying risk because they're in a dynamic situation. It changes throughout the day. It changes from daylight to nighttime. It changes with staff. As the staff numbers increase in the daytime and decrease at the nighttime, the risk change. And you have to mitigate and identify, first of all, identify those hazards and then mitigate those risks. And it takes us back to the fundamental. Risk may be a four letter word, but we have to understand and use it better. We have to make a culture uh, within where we work of, of doing risk assessments, understanding that risk is a function of both the likelihood of something happening and the consequences of that something happening. Because we're still dealing today with an infectious agent, not just SARS-CoV-2 virus, but there are other viruses, there's other bacteria out there. There's been other outbreaks of other illnesses we've seen over the summer months, like we do every year. We're moving into flu season, and we're still, again, now working diligently and hard and, 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 and putting in long hours in a working week, understanding what are the dynamics that are happening in the Southern Hemisphere that may help us plan in the Northern Hemisphere when we start to get uh, SARS-CoV-2 and all these other influenza-like viruses circulating. And it's important that every essential employee understands it's about protecting themselves. Again, not just physically, not just from being infected with this virus, but also emotionally and mentally. Understand what, what is the situation. Slow down everything. A lot of the just-in-time training that I do in hospitals and nursing homes and long-term facilities is getting everyone to slow down understand before you open that door, before you go into the room, what's behind that door, what's in that room that you need to protect yourself from. Are you protected? Do your assessment. And if yes, go and do the work that you're supposed to do. If not, 
then, then work out how to protect yourself or protect the room from, from what may be in there. And if we look at the hierarchy, uh, hierarchy of controls, again, personal protective equipment is the least effective. Physical distancing, engineering controls, and administrative controls really should come before we, re we rely solely or mainly or primarily on personal protective equipment. And that comes back down to looking at the floor plan, looking at the layout of our buildings, looking at where we work, making decisions based on space. Again, we talked about staff, we talked about stuff, we talked about space. It's so important that we look at, uh, at, from a systems perspective, of what the floor plans of where we work. Where is movement? Movement is our enemy. As we move about the building each day where we work, the, the potential, the, the possibility of transmitting virus is there, it's real. But it's important that we look at floor plans and we identify, based on our risk assessment, where those risks are highest, and where we can mitigate them. And you'll come up with a floor plan that looks a little bit like this. Again, uses the traffic light system, red, yellow, green, and then it identifies a, a risk assessment zone. I have hospitals now, right now, that are doing four, five, even up to six of these floor plans every day. As equipment moves, as patient moves, as staff come on for different shifts, they can highlight where the risk is in their particular ward or the department where they're working. So again, we have to do our risk assessment based on asymptomatic, symptomatic, positive asymptomatic, or positive symptomatic when it comes to COVID-19 disease. And it's so important that every time I, I, I give a workshop, I talk about decreasing the risk of being infected with this virus or any other virus, for example, you've got to cover your holes. That means eyes, nose, and mouth, or any cuts, or cuts or abrasions in your skin. You've got to cover your holes. And we should be, as a nation, thinking about how to cover our holes. And you'll find that, you know, yes, I may be in my attic today uh, talking to you today, but as soon as I go out, I will have a face covering or a face mask over my nose and my mouth, and then I'll have a face shield covering my eyes. And this is the equipment that I, that I routinely take, no matter whether I'm going to the grocery store, going to any other store, or I'm going to work. This is what I wear routinely. And again, because I've been fit tested, uh, I've gone through our uh, respiratory protection program at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. I know what respirator I can wear, but more importantly, on the back of my card that I carry, it tells me how to wear it properly. And what I see in so many facilities that I go to every week is that no one or very few, and all, maybe in some situations, only some are actually doing a a seal check every time they put on an N95 respirator. And it's so important that you, you learn how to do both a positive pressure and a negative pressure seal check every time you put on an N95 respirator to ensure that it fits tightly and works. But more importantly, uh, I, I wear a powered air purifying respirator and I have done since January. Uh, this is my Max Air Papa uh, that I wear uh, the battery life I get from uh, this particular unit, the battery that I'm carrying is about 10 hours. Uh, it has lights, you can see the lights at the top. It has a HEPA filter uh, at, at the top in the helmet there. Uh, it provides a positive pressure of air. Uh, it feels a little bit like air conditioning, so I can wear, in, I can wear it in, in different environments. And I can keep it on uh, as long as I need to until I need to eat food or drink something or I get hungry. Uh, but it's something that I wear all the time. And again, in, in the workshops that I'll be doing in Florida next week, in, in the hospitals that I go to, I'll be wearing my PAPA. And if most of the federal government I work, I work that I do, um, all the federal government employees are wearing uh, powered air purifying respirators. More importantly is the, the national stockpile uh, that uh, is maintained by the federal government had over 10,000 of these in the national stockpile before 2020. And again, if you, if you do wear a powered air purifying respirator, unfortunately, what we find at the local level, at the frontline level, is not everyone has access to them. Um, again, the particular unit that I wear is about $1,200. There's another unit out uh, uh, from Max Air, 3M, I've also got units uh, for about $700 or $800. Uh, this particular unit that I'm wearing here at this hospital, I've had for three years. Uh, and I have to clean, I have to replace the, the filters about every six months. But you've also, when you start wearing equipment like this, you've got to learn how to clean and maintain and disinfect it, but also how to store it. 
And as we go through you know, the, the, with working with nurses and physicians and other frontline staff in many states, the states that we go to, it's not just about the PP. And here's a, uh, a picture of a workshop recently in Tennessee where there was 34 different combinations of personal protective equipment. And we had to write and sit down and look at our standard operating procedures, our SOPs, our guidelines, our protocols, and make sure with those 34 different combinations from all those different hospitals that we could make them work. And we could in a safe environment. But really this year, most of what I wear, except for my, my PAPA, my powered air purifying respirator, everything else I wear was always one use, one time use. But now we've started to introduce terms like extended use, where we wear the same personal protective equipment like an N95 respirator for model encounters with patients or reuse where we put on and take off and put on and take off an N95 respirator for multiple encounters. And each time we do that, it increases the risk to us personally of being infected, especially if we're wearing, working, in, working in an environment with a high viral load. So our guiding principles have become this year, extended use is preferred over reuse. Reuse by a single person, where we may have shared in, tw in 2019, we do not share in 2020 when it comes to PPE. We don't use, reuse our N95 respirators after we've performed aerosol generating procedures, or they're damaged, or they get wet. And again, if we can come up with innovative ways to limit room traffic by using video conferencing, phone calls, text messages with our patients on what they need. We have one patient right now in hospital and he just loves ginger ale. And he goes through about 20 cans of ginger ale a day. And, and the nurses were going in and out each, each time delivering cans of ginger ale. I said, look, just give him a case. Just throw in 24 cans in there and say, that's it. We're not coming back in for the rest of the day. And he's fine. He's happy. But it's important that we look at that, that we limit our exposure, our risk of entering and re-entering rooms throughout our shifts. <clears throat> But also we focus so much on ourselves as essential employees of what PPE we should be wearing, our, our personal protective equipment, but what can we safely or comfortably put on a patient? There are some patients that you cannot put a procedure mask on. You cannot put a face shield on, but there are others where you can. For the Ebola patients that we dealt with, we used to wrap them up like a burrito and put them in a wheelchair before we moved them anywhere near past the nursing station, or we put them anywhere down from a, a room that they had to go to radiography or get a scan or come out for blood work or go to any other room. We moved as we moved them um, in, in a small confined area of the hospital. We really protected those patients. Right now, we're doing the same thing with our COVID-19 patients. Before we move them, we're stepping back, we're slowing things down. What can we do to protect us from the patient as well as uh, protect ourselves? But also, what, what can the patient, personal protective equipment, can the patient wear? Again, that risk of extended use and reuse of those one-time use items, those pieces of PPE that we've, we've traditionally only used one time, we increase the risk of contact transmission, our ability to protect as they get wet, moist, and out of shape. And again, the extended use causes additional discomfort. Who would have thought in 2020 that a brown paper bag would be worth so much to us, would have so much value? And again, here's my brown paper bag where as I take off my face shield, and my N95 respirator throughout the work that I do in hospitals, I'm hanging them on the handles because they're wet, they're moist, and I need to not lay them down on a surface, but I need to let them dry. Again, this is what it looks like from above. I've got my N95 respirator, my face shield, and my eye protection all in the same brown paper bag. And who would have thought even this year that we would, people who are stuck at home, working from home, not going into the office, who had a sewing machine would volunteer to help at such the level. Uh, in my neighborhood here in DC, we see hundreds, maybe even thousands of, of masks are made each day from a volunteer force. The challenge we had though, is that we didn't provide adequate guidance on how to properly make those masks. There's, there are some instructions out there, but it really wasn't, didn't go to scale. And so what we know from research, and here's a, a paper that was um, published by Anna Davies and her team, in Disaster Medicine and Public Health Preparedness Journal on testing the efficacy of homemade masks. Would they protect an influenza pandemic? This was back in 2013. And you can see different materials on the left-hand side here have different protection factors against, say, for example, a one micron particle. That's information we knew seven years ago, and we still have seen many other papers published showing the same information. 
why isn't that information being delivered appropriately to all these volunteers that are trying their best, doing their hardest, trying to make masks that will protect them and their loved ones? Back into the hospitals we work, now we've had to come up with reminders. Uh, you know, how do we remind people? How do we put signs up? Are your, is your eye protection on? Have you changed your gloves? And you see these all over the place. And as we spray and clean and disinfect, uh, these get wet and they have to be replaced. We haven't come up with an easier system on how to provide commu risk communication to, to our employees, to our staff, as we work in facilities where there's a viral load. And this was the challenge, and this is what I really wanted to emphasize on these next few slides of real world examples from hospitals, long-term care facilities, nursing homes, as we ran out of personal protective equipment, as we had stockouts, as we had a, a facility that only had one relationship with one distributor, one vendor, one, one, one source of getting material, and as soon as they ran out, they didn't have a plan B, they didn't have an alternative distributor to provide them um, with prote personal protective equipment, and we had to go back to our risk assessment and say, what are we trying to do? What are we trying to protect? How can we best do that? And more importantly, as we came up with innovative approaches like this one here, that this photo shows here, we had to engage with OSHA. We had to engage with both the state and community health departments. Will this work for you? Do you understand what we're trying to do when we have no more gowns, no more Tyvek suits? And as you can see, I'm, I'm actually wearing a waterproof jacket and a waterproof pants, even into the hospital today, when I go into the emergency department, knowing that the hospital still has limited supplies of personal protective equipment, I will wear my waterproof jacket, my waterproof pants, my waterproof shoes, so that I can be, again, sprayed down with soap and water, uh, uh, a disinfectant, uh, clean it, I can hang it up in the shower, and I can re-wear it again. And I wear this all the time in the hospital, because I know where I work, we still have limited supplies of critical components that we need to protect ourselves. And the training. So where do we do adequately, where do we, when we're doing just-in-time training, where is it safe to do that? In the car park, outside in the courtyard? How do we actually work together with the nurses that I work with, coming up with innovative solutions, again, ensure that we meet the standards, the regulations, the requirements, but we, we come up with solutions that decrease the risk and use what's available. And then not just doing one workshop or one training, but going back over regular periods of time to do retraining, but also to see that everyone is doing what they were taught to do from the very first workshops, and they can still maintain that consistency of doing it properly. <clears throat> and as we started to understand that COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2 virus spread by droplets, we had to protect hallways, buildings, other parts of our rooms from droplet spread. And as we started to put up shower curtains or physical barriers like this, Again, we had to get the fire brigade involved to make sure it wasn't a fire hazard. We had to get the county health department to come and have a look to make sure that there was no codes that they were aware of that we breached. And again, that we could actually maintain these barriers, these physical barriers up, clean and disinfect them, but also based on our own risk assessment for our particular facility, this helped protect both our, our patients, our staff, our residents, whoever may be using that building. <clears throat> what to do? when we had to reuse personal protective equipment. Where did we hang it? Did we have hanging space for that? What did that hanging space look like? What are the rooms where we don, put on the PPE and doff and take it off? What did those look like? How could we facilitate this process? We provided job aids that were mainly visual through photos, but mirrors. Went down to Walmart or Target and grabbed as many mirrors as we could so that when people started putting on the PPE, they could check themselves before going into the room with the patient that they were safe, that they had put it on pro 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 properly. When they came out, they could look in the mirror and then make sure that nothing's moved, nothing's slipped, and they could understand by, based on their own personal risk assessment what they needed to do to take it off safely. The number of signs that have gone up in our hospitals, our nursing homes, and other facilities the way that we've divided elevators, um, you know, positive workers only use this one, administrative workers, kitchen workers, negative workers use this area and created those physical barriers, those physical separations based on the testing that we do. And again, even the work that I do now, I still get swabbed, tested every Wednesday. Uh, when do I get my results? Usually by Friday. The turnaround time is still, 20, and it's still up to 48 hours before I get my results. And Wednesday happens to be the day we get swabbed and we do that every Wednesday. 
And the goal of standard operating procedures or protocols, we've got, we work with different people, but we need those different people to do the same thing. And then we need them to get the same result. <clears throat> but more importantly, as we write our protocols, our procedures, our standard operating procedures, do people, does everyone understand them? Can they physically do them? Was the outcome the intended outcome? And that's a continuous part of our continuous performance uh, process. Do we, we have to continually evaluate what we're trying to do to make sure that we're performance based and what we're doing, what we're trying to do is it can actually be implemented and operationally done and achieved. And we've seen articles that have published such as this one in the annals of uh, internal medicine. Although PPE is effective at decreasing exposure to infected bodily fluids among healthcare workers, its presence is simply not enough. Personal protective equipment itself can introduce risk. The proper training and competency in donning, that's putting it on, doffing, taking off, is essential. Then we also have to have systems in place to monitor all of our employees, our staff, to make sure we use it properly. Again, I have made mistakes. I have, there's been times when I've come out and I have been exhausted, fatigued, and I have said to people, I just can't take this off safely. Someone's going to have to put PPE on and help me get out of my PPE. And for Ebola, that happened quite a lot. But not just our frontline and central employees, not just our nurses, not just our physicians or our specialists, but also other essential employees that should have been designated as essential employees right from the start need to be trained in putting on taking off PPEs safely and how to use it safely, such as cleaning or janitorial staff here. And this particular group here uh, was, was, was a group of, again, English was not their first language and it was learning by doing to take them through the process of putting it on, working, doing what they had to do, and then more importantly, how to take it off safely. Understanding that we use different products, just different disinfectants. All these disinfectants have to be or should be on the EPA registered list N before we use them. We have to read the labels. In 2019, we didn't read labels. Now we need to do that. We have to ensure that when we read the label, we know how to use the product as well as the equipment that we have to clean and disinfect. And again, the challenge we have, and I'm in my 50s, and when I look at the font on the back of these labels, I find it really hard to read. We've got to go back to the manufacturer, back to the regulatory body and say, look, the labels are there, that's great, but we can't understand them. They're complicated, they're complex, or the font's too small, and this is not making a safe, this is not helping us create a safe environment in our hospitals. Again, everything should be EPA registered disinfectants. They're not marketed like that. People weren't familiar with EPA registration numbers, and we still don't know where to look for those numbers and what they mean. But it's important, the learning curve has been steep, and lots of us have had to understand that before we start to spray something in a hospital, for example, we need to look at the EPA registration number. And more importantly, we need to understand what the dwell or wet contact time, how long should the surface stay wet to kill or inactivate this virus? And as we focused on high touch points with our products, we've also brought in you know, observers to, to collect behavioral data of how did we do it properly? And it's so important in this example here, not to do it every day, but on a regular basis, observe what we should be doing in our SOPs to ensure that we do it properly and to, to the best of what we're trying to do to mitigate and decrease risk. We've come up with other innovative uh, ideas throughout hospitals and nursing homes of covering those high touch points with, for example, here's plastic that allows it to be clean and disinfected easy, easier than, and, and, and not uh, cause any long-term damage to the, for example, light switches or elevator buttons. But more importantly, there were other people that came into our hospitals, our nursing homes, our long-term long -term facilities, long-term care facilities to provide emotional support. And they had to be trained in how to put on and take off PPE. For, exa for example, this entertainer who used to bring in her guitar every day to play to residents or patients on a daily basis was trained how to use appropriate personal protective equipment. And the fact that we weren't really putting a lot of attention initially on towels, sheets, um, pillow, pillow cases, and now we have lots of data and research that shows, yes, the virus lasts, lives, remains infectious on these materials not just for hours, but for days, and how important it is when now handling and laundering of these uh, of, of towels, bed sheets, and pillowcases, how important it is that we follow appropriate protocols that mitigate risk. And more importantly, that people who prepared food in the kitchens 
are now wearing N95 respirators and have to go through a respiratory protection program, many of them for the very first time as they deliver the food on trays. And how do you get food into a room where the patient is positive by a laboratory test, has COVID-19 with symptoms, what's that level of personal protective equipment you need, how many times you need to put it on to give them fluid, water, food throughout, throughout a 24 hour period. And what we've seen and what's been challenged and we're still challenged is that as we've cleaned, done more cleaning and disinfecting, we've worn more personal protective equipment, we've created more waste, especially more infectious waste. And this is, this is a photo at the back of a hospital where yes, their normal daily procedures in 2019 didn't create this much waste. They're creating much more waste now and they just don't have the facilities, the space to deal with infectious waste. And so we see this, I see this every day. And again, we're working as hard as we can to come up with solutions that work for them. One of the last things I wanna talk about is that it's so important now in a hospital setting, uh, nursing, when we're dealing with patients, even the worried well, in a nursing home or a long-term care facility, the fact that we have to form pairs, we have to work in groups, the buddy systems become so important for us. And here Dave and I are working together in this is in a nursing home where you can see that we're wear, wearing our, our, our waterproof clothing that we bought from REI. Uh, we've got our, our N95 respirators and our face shield on. And again, we are constantly watching out for each other to make sure that we have no breaches of protocol and no breaches of safety. And it's all about practice and training. And I can't emphasize enough that personal protective, personal protective equipment itself can create a hazard. hazard. It's not just we just do initial training, we need to maintain skill sets and competencies by doing continual retraining uh, and, and ensuring that what we do is appropriate. Here's some of the rules, regulations, and guidelines that I've, uh, uh, I use to reference to put together these slides and the work that I do. Again, you can look up the, the, the CDC guidelines, recommendations, the uh, OSHA standards, and also the EPA list end. And it's so important now that we look at the indicators and metrics that are appropriate for us to ensure what we do is, 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 is appropriate for the risk that we've identified. And as businesses reopen, and the constant question that I get a month ago, today, and I'll get it tomorrow as well, when we go into a building, an enclosed space, are we safe? How can we ensure that we can mitigate risk and make it safer? And right now we're doing so much training. There's so much training going on in just-in-time use of personal protective equipment, just-in-time cleaning and disinfection. Rewriting some of the protocols and SOPs that we had a month ago, we're now rewriting those again as the situation is changing. And, and again, this is, con this is a constant dynamic situation we find ourselves and we're working towards always continuous improvement of our processes and protocols and procedures. Thanks, Jackie. That's Thank you, me. Gavin. You always provide a wealth of information. Um, there is a question that just came in regarding um, waste. So should waste from a COVID patients be placed in red bags because that's not what's being done in Pennsylvania? And maybe Nikki or um, Aisha have um, something to contribute to that as well. It's a, it, it's a question, Jackie, I get all the time. Because we're not told to do something, it means it's not infectious, it's not a hazard, it's not a risk. And we have to look at this through the lens of what is our risk assessment in the facility where we work. The, the, what I'm seeing out of the patients, and especially the swabs, we take environmental swabs all the time in the hospitals I work in. The viral load counts we're getting back are really high. There's a lot of virus out there in the environment. And so I would, again, I'm treating that, anything that comes out of a patient's room as infectious waste. That's just me personally, and that's what I do. Does it meet the federal regulations or the state? Maybe not, maybe they differ, but it's how I do my personal risk assessments. Yeah, I think in um, the state of Pennsylvania, at least the guidance we've been given is that it does not have to be placed in a, a red bag, a waste bag, um, unless it has other contaminated materials on it that would otherwise require it to be placed in a red bag. And it makes life easier for us, Nicole, if we don't have to do that. But again, we have got to ensure that when it goes outside the building, it just goes somewhere safe. Yeah, I know some sites have double bagged, um, you know, so they'll double bag in a regular um, garbage bag um, when they're disposing of um, materials from a room of a COVID positive resin to protect the environmental staff that are, are clearing those bags from the rooms, for example. 
I've, I've, I've recently visited a landfill site in Maryland and I can tell you what I found. I've got some wonderful photos of stuff. <laughs> Yuck. <laughs> so, uh, Gavin, may I ask a question? Yes. Uh, so, uh, thank you for a, a wonderful lecture. So, uh, you are recommending that um, even if there is no COVID in our facilities, we should be wearing, uh, the, the physicians and the providers should be wearing goggles, a surgical mask, at minimum. Aisha, that's a really great question. Um, again, if you asked me a few months ago, when I'd come back, you know, back in February when I came back from Hong Kong and I hadn't seen asymptomatic patients, we didn't see them in Hong Kong when I came back. And now that I've seen a lot of them, uh, that worries me. Um, it worries me that I do still have a lot of very close contact with people all the time. So I, I just don't know where it is. And I'm, I've seen too many of my friends and colleagues now um, be infected. I've still got this three physicians here in the neighborhood. I live in DC. They got infected back in March. And I can honestly say they went to that, they went to that convention that was in Lower Manhattan at the Hilton Hotel between March 4th and 8th. Mm. All three of them are not doing well today. We're in September. Are you kidding me? Now, if I didn't see that from my personal experience, then I wouldn't believe it either. But I do believe it because I've seen it from my personal experience. So right now, all my teams when we deploy on, when we go, we're leaving Tuesday. When we deploy on Tuesday down to Florida, the team I'm taking, from the time you leave your house, guys, you need to protect your eyes, nose, and mouth, 100%. And I, I think um, Dr. Osavala and I have been kind of stating that as well, even though face shield and goggles are not yet the standard of care, but we, we've been trying to do that as much as possible for our team and for our providers. Um, and what do you think about the facilities that dealt with red zones and ran out of or were short on PPE and sprayed their gowns? You think that was a reasonable thing to do? That was my life back in 2014 in West Africa with Ebola. So much so that the, the, the message I got for Ebola was, Gavin, you don't smell strong enough. We're going to spray you again. And again, you know, from the the, the bleach, whatever percent, percent it was, I lost my sense of smell and sense of taste for months mm -hmm. after I came back on my third trip. Uh, I had three trips to West Africa to treat Ebola patients. Right now, when I wear those, when you saw Dave and I in our waterproofs, I've been wearing those since Hong Kong. I can honestly say I, I swab them, I, I wash them, I wash them with soap and water, I wash them with 100 parts per million chlorine dioxide that I use in a spray bottle. I let them dry, then I rinse them off in the shower. And then when I go back to work tomorrow, I'll put them back on again. Okay. Yeah, I think the challenge in the nursing home, has been, we've totally gotten away from conventional use of gowns, you know, donning a new gown for each resident care episode. And I think more recently, some sites that have dealt with ongoing transmission, the concern was um, around the gown um, of the staff member being worn in and out of a room so as to protect the worker potentially increasing transmission from, you know, one patient to another, particularly in the yellow zone. In the red zone, eh, maybe it doesn't matter so much because they all have it, but in the yellow zone especially, and that's where I think we've really struggled. Some of, many of them have the reusables now, or at least from the perspective of at least having some gown, they have reusables and those don't really lend themselves to being wiped down or sanitized on the front. Um, so I think that's, you know, an ongoing challenge that we're going to face in dealing with yellow zones and um, trying to get sites to conventional uh, gown supply levels um, and how to optimize when you don't. It's a really good point, Nicole. I can give you an example of what I did in a hospital a couple of months ago. Um, I had a couple of physicians and a couple of surgeons that just wanted to argue with me about droplet spread and protection from, from, from drop, from, from anything that I kept saying that anything that, that, that's wet that comes out of the body, you need to be protected from. And I, and they had their, 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 their surgical gowns on. I had a glass of water and I sat there and said, this is not going anywhere. And I went and I splashed them with the glass of water. And I said, where'd that go? I said, Oh, it went right through to my skin. I said, yeah, that's droplet spread. And I said, you really have to ensure that because we're getting so close, so intimate uh, in, in a high viral load environment, that's not working. It may look good. It may, you may look like the photo from CDC, but from our risk assessment we just did here in the emergency department, that's not appropriate protection in a high viral load environment. We need to put something on that's a little bit more impermeable, waterproof. And that's what we did. We changed. 
I hate to be the person that breaks up parties, um, but it is three o'clock and we pride ourselves on respecting your time. Um, so I would say if there are any other questions for Gavin or for anyone else, please feel free to put them into the chat. Um, we thank you for your engagement and um, you will be receiving an email with the links that we've already posted in the chat for your session evaluation to our participant resources. Remembering you can claim CME credits, but you need to complete that evaluation. Um, and if you're not claiming CME, we really would appreciate your input because it helps us to continue to improve our, our sessions. And finally, we will see you again on September 17th at 2 p.m. And um, Gavin, good luck when you're deployed down to Florida. I hope you stay safe weather and virus wise. No, thanks, Jackie. I work with wonderful people. And I just wanted to, to, to close with, guys, we're all on the same team. And again, we're, it's a dynamic situation. Let's just all work together to come up with solutions that keep us safe and our families safe. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.